the one day Vic was had an open court on handball. Greg Scarpa Jr. and uh, his friend approached Vic and his friend asked Vic if they wanted to play doubles. And Vic said no, uh, because, you know, dude's old man's a snitch. And I don't know if, if he's tainted, you know, he might be one too. I don't know. And so later that day or that evening, we had all had some pasta and uh, Vic was washing his bowl out in the mop closet. He was bent over that and, and Greg Scarpa Jr. walked in there with a pipe and cracked him in the back of the head with it. Game over, 170 stitches. They locked down the whole, actually, they locked down the entire Bureau of Prisons when it happened. And then they shipped 20 of us out of there. Uh, yeah. And I went to Atlanta. And then about two weeks later, Vic showed up in Atlanta. Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. Got a show for you today uh, with a man named Robert McNeese. I got onto him. I can't remember. He was on another podcast, I think, and I listened to his stories, and and he was great. I'll tell you, I was impressed. And uh, and we have Robert McNeese here. Welcome, Robert. Oh, well, thank you. I, I'm really happy Good to, to have you on the show. We we you know we've had a couple three conversations, and uh, you know I understand you live up in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, right now, and there's about five feet of snow or something. Oh, no, no, not five feet, but, but it's, it, there's enough. There's enough. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of snow today, a lot of blizzard, blizzard conditions today. <laughs> Let's start off with you met a lot of mob guys in prison and, and you got a lot of great stories. You also got noticed by Paramount Pictures and they want to tell your life story, even though you've never written a book. And and I, I'm not sure how they got hold of you exactly, but somebody told them about your story and they were impressed enough with, with your life experiences that, that they want to do a, a whole series on you. And and I believe it's going to be called The Honorable Man. Is that correct? Yeah, they, they got on to me from Bill Stacks. Okay. Just tell us a little bit. I think everybody's curious about that. How does that go down when they, they just like call you or Bill introduces yeah. you or whatever? How does that work? Uh, Well, I got a call. Well, yeah. Um, Bill Stacks reached out to me. Uh, he had interviewed a, a guy that I was incarcerated with, and he gave him my information. So he got a hold of me. Bill Stacks did. Asked if I wanted to do the, a podcast, and I, you know, it was something new to me. So I said, "Yeah, I'll do one." And so we did the, the podcast. A week later, I got a phone call from from Bill again, wanting to introduce me to a guy out in California that that's interested in doing a TV movie or a mini, mini series or something like that, and I said, oh, okay, well, that's cool. So he gave my information and he called me and just started talking and uh, ended up he's going to, they're going to do eight episodes, season one, and they're hoping that it'll carry over to season two. Interesting. And it's just a lot of my life in, incarcerated. And uh, I think every week it's going to have like a different uh, person that, you know, uh, that I've met that, you know, they have a little story behind it. And I guess that uh, would be intriguing to the, to the population, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it will be. I've seen the list of people and uh, we're going to talk about them and, and your interactions with them and really kind of tell people, you know, a little bit about what this series is going to be like when it finally gets done. Uh, I mean, you were, you met people like Christy, the tick Panari uh, with uh, fat Tony Salerno with Tony ducks, Carollo. I mean, you met Danny Marino, you met some of the big people. How did you end up in a federal penitentiary? Well, uh, I robbed a bank. Uh, I did a, a bank robbery in Cedar Rapids. Went in, I was a young kid, young and dumb. I went into the bank, and uh, I had known some some bank robbers, <laughs> uh, <laughs> some you know real live bank robbers, and I was like fascinated by them. But I got to be friends with one of them, and he, he kind of like taught me how to rob banks <laughs> well, the way they did it. I I went and did it, and uh, I don't know, got caught. <laughs> got caught like a, a couple weeks later. I actually turned myself in, you know, young, you know, I didn't yeah. know what I was doing. What so they, did they have their picture, turned, picture out there on the news from the cameras or something? Or <laughs> somebody rat you out? Uh, yeah, someone told on me. They, okay. The Spider-Man mask, I was wearing a full mask with little holes in it. It was a Spider-Man mask. Okay. <laughs> and I had throw, thrown it off the, over the bridge and they found it and my hair particles were in it. Uh. Or, you know, hair samples or whatever, <laughs> you know, hair. And then... uh Someone had told him that, yeah, that was my mask. You know, uh, I had bought okay. it. Yeah, thus <laughs> begins your tour of the federal penitentiary system. And and usually you're never in just one. Right. What yeah. what was the first one you went into? Um, The first one was in Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of it. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Oxford. I'm sorry. Oxford, Oxford Wisconsin. Okay. 
Now, yeah. did you, is that where you start, start, first started hooking up with some of these mob guys or? I was fortunate when I was a young, younger guy, I had worked for uh, a wax museum of uh, Elvis Presley's wax museum. The wax museum would go on to like carnival grounds that was owned by, you know, different people. And uh, one of them was Danny Marino, uh, a Gambino guy that I didn't even know anything. I didn't. I didn't even know what the Gambinos were back then. So, <laughs> yeah. but it was me and my sister worked for this museum of selling tickets and selling pictures of Alvis, things like that at the stores. Danny Marino was what would come and, uh, you know, he'd buy us, you know, lunch or dinner and, you know, just, just you know, just looking out for us. He's mm -hmm. a really nice guy. And, uh, and that was it. That was, that was my only interaction with him. So I'm in the, I get to Oxford, Wisconsin. I get off the bus and I go to receiving and discharge and, you go through the the whole routine of you know seeing a uh, nurse to make sure you're you're healthy enough to go on the yard and see a, a, a investigative officer to make sure that you know you're not going to have any problems and so when they finally release you they give you a bedroll with two sheets pillowcase and a, mm -hmm. and a blanket and some shampoo in it and soap and they point open up a door and they point in this big prison yard you know you're you're waiting you know your unit is down here on the right. So, you know, you got to walk about two blocks. Oh, my you know? God. <laughs> so you're doing that. Here you are. You're wearing bus pants, which are brown, wrinkled pants and a white T-shirt. And everyone's looking at you. <laughs> you know, and I'm I'm nervous wrecked. Oh, I can you know, I'm walking there all by myself, walking with that. You know, and I'm like, man, this is hell. And I'm looking and the guys are just, you know, you know, they all want to be tough guys. You know, and, yeah. and so they're all staring at me like, oh, man. And all of a sudden I hear, hey, Bobby, Bobby. And it and I look. I didn't recognize him. He came up, gave me a big hug. He said, hey, "Man, you don't remember me?" And he and uh, he said, "Dan." And then I remember. I, you know, so I was never so happy in my life. <laughs> no, I but, can uh, imagine. Yeah, was, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Danny Marino was the first one I, I had seen in uh, the prison. Uh, interesting. You know, and then, uh, Danny, uh, from Danny there, Marino, he was a real mob guy for sure. And the Gambino family, I looked a little bit up about him. One of his early arrests was, was assault on an FBI agent outside of a Catholic church at a mass for another old time mafia. So, so he was, he was a pretty tough guy himself. When, when he was a kid, he, he was indicted in 93 on conspiracy to commit murder, uh, on a guy who was going to testify in a grand jury hearing in New York about the trash hauling industry. And, and he was connected to uh, gas pipe Casso. And, you know, he was, uh, I mean, he, he was a pretty bad guy himself, but not really to you. It sounds like. Yeah. Most of them are real nice guys, you know, they're, they're yeah. gentlemen. Yeah. Um, um, so I'm sure he, you found that out through your yeah. career, but Oh yeah. Right then and there he goes, that's where I was going to. And I said, I was going down to wood, wood unit. That was the, orientation unit for one side the other side was they had you know uh inmates mm -hmm. and he goes let me go ask my friend he's looking for a cell i'm gonna tell him see what he says well oh, this friend of his was chris fenari you know christy tick mm -hmm. so i go down and and you know daddy was, says here come on he wants to talk to you so i go down and meet him and uh you know if he, he decides you know i could be his roommate so that was my that's where i got moved the guard moved me right into a cell and that was it you know and I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know who he was or anything like that. And it wasn't until like uh, probably a month after I was in there that I, that I kind of like figured out, you know, that, you know, this guy's pretty important. I mean, people are showing him a lot of respect mm -hmm. and opening doors and bringing him all sorts of things. And it's just like, you know, I was like, you know, first I thought it was, you know, Oh, prison's pretty cool. It's all, you get all this stuff, you know, but then it was just him. So I, I kind of figured it out. <laughs> now but, uh, uh, he's the one i used to ask him all the time uh just dumb questions because i didn't know any better you know yeah. like hey did you really do this i'd read something about him you know and, and <laughs> yeah. you can't ask me that <laughs> you know, and, yeah you know and just yeah you know, I, I, he, he I kind of told me on what to do you know in prison, really so. he had a social club called the 19th hole in new york <laughs> and in a whole cruise there and benson hurst he was he was like you know, real deal mob guy, made guy. He had people like Vic Amuso and Gas Pipe Casso working for him. They were great earners. They had a burglar gang called the Bypass Gang. Stole millions of dollars. I mean, did he talk about any of that kind of stuff? I, probably not. But um, no, actually, no, he didn't. He never did. He talked about the the trial that he had, and, and uh, you know, he eventually won his case, and and or 
I don't know if he won the case, but he eventually got out. And he lived, I think, five more years after he got out or something. Oh, really? I think he was like 97 or 98 when he passed away. He kind of took you under his wing, right. if I, I understand you right. Yeah. And, and so kind of showed you the ways of the prison, sure. not maybe particularly the yeah. ways of the mafia, but the ways of a mafia dude in the penitentiary system and how that works. Tell us, got any examples of kind of some of the lessons he taught you on how to navigate in that system? I guess because of who he was, he had like connections, you know, people in the laundry room and in the commissary and in the kitchen, you know, you know, you'd get some, you know, get a couple uh green peppers and a couple tomatoes, you know, would end up on the desk in the, in the cell, you know, mm -hmm. someone from food service would bring it to him. So, you know, basically there's a lot of it out of respect for him. I seen how he moved, you know, I seen how he operated, you know, I mean, people respected him and mm -hmm. they knew who he was and, and, you know, so they just, he just was able to do whatever he wanted, you know, and most of the guys were, were like that. And, and lucky for me, <laughs> after I had been in for several years, um, I was able to do those kind of things, you know, um, just because I was, uh, you know, around all the guys and, and, you know, they accepted me and, and I used it sometimes you know, to my advantage, <laughs> uh, you know, and, I mean, not be a fool not to, you know, Yeah. but yeah, it was, it, it made my prison stay a whole lot better. <laughs> I can imagine. You know? So you were able to get connections in the, in, with the cooks, for example, to get some extra food. Yeah. Run right. and get that and and maybe some some phone time that that other people didn't get. Did, did they have any of those uh, smuggling any of those cell phones and that you noticed? Yeah, we were guys? getting we were getting ten of them a month for ten thousand hmm. um, dollars. They were selling them a thousand a piece. Wow. Uh, and that's when a flip phone was a hundred dollars, and you know, so the, the, yeah, the guard would be you know making quite a bit of money. Really? So but yeah, what, did guys when they like came out. Did they sell time on that? If you had one of those phones and you you go to him and and get some money put on his books or something and oh no no no, they just no. used it themselves. Yeah, just them. No one else ever was able to use them. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, I know what you're that. talking about, but yeah, they didn't do that. The commerce and that. So w what did right. you use for money in the penitentiary? Did you was there used to be you know the old story was that you cigarettes were commerce so but you guys um, say no you can't smoke in well, penitentiaries when I, <laughs> well when i first went in there was still money on the yard okay you, know, you could buy 25 dollars worth of change you know every week so there would be oh. guys with thousands of dollars a quarter rolls of quarters you know okay and then after they got rid of the money and all the you know they had like little vending machines they got rid of all that prison money became stamps books of stamps so if you want so it's like five dollars a book you want to help somebody out, you get them some stamps, or you want to trade something off, you can you, you trade them off the stamps. Right, for like, the, the, like a, a piece of chicken was, t you know, 10 stamps. Okay. You know, like that. So you food service guy would come and give you a piece of chicken or 10 stamps. The tick, did, did he like have meetings that were, you know, you were excluded from? Did they, uh, how did they conduct this mafia business? And I'm sure they conducted some. Christy, uh, you know, he didn't have meetings. He, he, uh, he just kind of like laid low and, and they would do, you know, guys would, you know, want to see him and they'd go out to the, to the yard and do, you know, walk around the track and just okay. talk, you know, talk and walk. That'd be about the only time. Now, did y'all get together? I think of the scene from uh, Goodfellas where they all got together and, and you were kind of like their Henry Hill. You were their Peckerwood, their, their non-Italian that had a lot of connections throughout the penitentiary or throughout that prison that could run and get things and bring it back. And then they'd cook big joint meals. Did you see any of that? Did they do that like in the movie? My first pasta dish was with Christy and he made it out of a garbage can with... <laughs> With, with boiling water, the stinger, and, and I never mm -hmm. seen one before, so it was like all new to me. But no, Christy and, and I would just like cook in the cell. Just okay. with us. In Atlanta, though, it was a different story. Did you ever make jailhouse nachos or prison nachos? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah, got I a yeah. YouTube video out there with my friend Steve St. John that made jailhouse nachos for me. And, and then we ate them on his back deck. <laughs> so and how were they? They were good. So tell the guys yeah. how you make jailhouse nachos. I don't know what kind you have. We usually get, uh, uh, you know, a 24 pack of canned pop. They come in that cardboard box. Yeah. We put a garbage bag. We line that up with the garbage bags and set, you know, flat. Then we put the chips on the bottom, but we'd cook, uh, 
like the chili bags of chili we'd open up we pour the chili on it we'd have uh summer sausage chop chop that yeah. up onions uh green peppers tomatoes and we'd get a bunch of cheese and Velveeta cheese and squeeze cheese yeah um jalapenos <laughs> just yeah and then we'd put it in the microwave in yeah. the in the, in the so, garbage bag yeah, when steve did he put it all good. together and then and he they'd shook make it up. They, <laughs> oh in a garbage bag yeah 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 <laughs> And yeah, then you make, had they used to make soups like that. Oh, really? So then you also yeah. then you had these little containers that you could then put it out into. Right. Yeah. So that's what the yeah. Uh, that's, that's just a different version. Yeah. Yeah. We used it. We but tore the apart soups the, are the same way. That, oh, really? How did you make the soup then? Yeah, they just throw the soups in a bag, crush them up, throw them in a bag, throw a little cheese, their meat, you know, their vegetables all together, and put the hot water in there and. And just shake it, shake it up, and tie a knot in, and let it sit and cook for about five ten minutes, and then then it'd be dump it out into a big bowl and serve it. You ended up going to another penitentiary, is that right? From there, yeah. yeah. And, and who'd you meet there? Did you were you able to take this relationship with this mob guy and then parlay that to other relationships with other mob guys? Yeah. Um, well, I, I ended up in Atlanta penitentiary. Well, no, I'm sorry. I ended up in, um, I think it was Leavenworth. I went to first. I went to Leavenworth. And uh, from Leavenworth, I went to Terre Haute and then Terre Haute to Atlanta. But okay. yeah, I am yeah, I was able to meet, you know, all sorts of different guys. Uh, Joy Tester was in Terre Haute with us. Uh, Leavenworth, there was a lot of like Midwest guys, Chicago, uh, yeah. St. Louis, Kansas City. Yeah. Um, I didn't really... You know them. I had a problem with one of them, and just you know. Otherwise, I'd say uh, Atlanta was probably where I met, you know, and, and interacted. Um, there in Springfield, I met uh, Fat Tony Salerno. Yeah. And Tony Ducks. Now was and that, interacted was that, with them a lot. Yeah. Was it was it? Uh, let's talk about Vic Amuso. Was that where you was that Atlanta where you met Vic Amuso? No, we met in Terre Haute, and oh, okay. then he was assaulted, and so they transferred all of his closest associates. So, and so tell, I tell us, ended up in Atlanta. Tell us about that assault. Vic, Vic, Vic Amuso, uh, an uh, older, older gentleman, but was the best number, number one in the whole prison system for handball. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just very physically fit. And so everyone wanted to play him. So one day a guy approached him and asked if he could do partners with him. And he said no, because the guy's partner was Greg Scarpa Jr. Vic told the guy, you know, you know, his father's a, an informant. I don't know if he is too. So I don't want nothing to do with him. Greg Scarpa Jr. got into his feelings over it, and that night, uh, Vic was after dinner was washing his bowl out in the mop closet, and dude came in behind him and hit him with a pipe, hit mm. about 170 stitches. Wow! So, so uh, that's then, when uh, that's when they locked down and what yeah, happened? they locked down the whole yeah they locked down everything, and Greg Scarpa was out of that prison in two hours. Mm. <laughs> what they think there was you know, a mob so, war on or something? It'd be a bunch of people killed. Well, I mean, they never let Greg Scarper walk a yard ever again, you know, oh, in the really? federal prison system. Uh, yeah, I mean, he can't never go anywhere. So they took him, locked him down. Yeah, they locked us all down, and, and I ended up in Atlanta, and a couple weeks later, Vic showed up. Uh, that's when we, be, you know, we were roommates, became pretty close. Okay. Um, that's where, uh, <clears throat> you know, for years, you know, I was with him, and yeah, I, be, I became pretty close with him. So, uh, so he's a tell good us guy. Tell us what that was like. I'm curious. I mean, is he like his personality? Um, first of all, maybe what, what was his personality like? Is he friendly? He was, yes, very, very outgoing, friendly. Um, he never discussed uh, mob yeah. business with anyone. Uh, he would get upset sometimes to say things, you know, that he probably shouldn't have, but, but he, but he all in all, he was, a, he was a, you know, he'd help, he'd give his shirt off the back, you know, his back for somebody if he liked them. Uh, but he's always, you know, looking out for guys and and uh, you know just a just a good guy, always on the move, uh, real athletic, um, yeah, real physically uh, fit. Um, but yeah, we started. I mean, you know, Atlanta, <laughs> yeah, Atlanta prison was uh, was a hellhole. There was a time when I think it was like ninety five, ninety six, maybe. What was that right after the, the Cuban riot? So it was like 90 or when they oh, opened yeah. it back up. So like 95, 96, the guards, they had all hired by the 
right and from atlanta they put up posters in the in the ghettos and we're at looking for inner city employees to come you know to come work at the penitentiary and i kid you not i walked in there and and there was the guards were wearing big thick rope chains around their necks and yeah and uh <laughs> So, you know, you'd walk down the hall and, and they have uh, metal detectors. There'd be like six of them or five lined up, you know, wall to wall. And all the guards are, you know, like this with their arms crossed while you walk through. And, you know, if a black guy from Atlanta would walk through and it'd go beep, 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 the, the guard would just go like this and start throwing gang signs. And the guy would take, you know, walk off. <laughs> you know, if, uh, if it was me, he walked through there, beep, beep, beep. They'd snatch me up, pull me against the wall, make me take my shoes off, you know. And, but that was the difference there. And, and at that time, there was not one, not not one warden, captain, associate warden, or guard there that was white. Every mm. single one of them was black or Hispanic. Wow. And uh, which I didn't, I mean, it didn't bother me. I didn't care. But they were crooked as hell. I mean, were you get liquor, you know, a uh, pint of liquor in a gallon baggie for $25. Or uh, there was a chicken shop. It got the penitentiary in Atlanta is in the heart of the ghetto mm. in in Atlanta. So it's it's on Mc, McDonald Boulevard, and you can see the chicken shop right there from the window, and the, and the liquor store. And so twenty five dollars a bag, and then uh, you could get a two piece of chicken and a little bun and potatoes and gravy uh, for twenty five dollars. <laughs> and we had one guard. This, you know, before there was an incident uh, in a prison. The guards through the union, they couldn't be searched. Mm -hmm. And they would come in with duffel bags like this over their shoulders, <laughs> you know, every day from work, you know, when they come in to go to work. And they would, I mean, it was just insane. But yeah, was one guard the whole time I was in, in there in Atlanta, this guy, he would bring probably, I'd say 10 things of liquor and 10 things of chicken every, every day he worked. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of money, you know, you figure yeah. it out if you've, you know, been doing it for 10 years or something. You know, it's a pretty good supplement and, to your uh, salary. Yeah, for sure. it was crazy. So we had. So now how did Vic yeah, in, in about, Atlanta, in Atlanta, did you have a little uh, group of Italians that all kind of hung together and sat at a table together and kind of stuck together? You know, like in the, the school cafeteria, only there were tables, not the long ones, but just round tables. You mm -hmm. know, you could sit four guys. Um, there would be like in Atlanta, there was like five tables that was that was ours. And everyone knew in the whole prison. You know, if, if we didn't come to eat, they wouldn't, they'd be empty for the whole meal. You know, they would, mm. no one would sit in them. And same with, you know, like the Hispanics or the blacks, you know, they'd have their own, then no one would mess with them. And that's just the way it is, you know. And so, yeah, we had our own tables. Did you have the Aaron Brotherhood, so, the ABs, the brand there? No, they didn't. They had okay. the brand in, in Leavenworth. I didn't think they would really want the brand in, in the Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah, I can see why. Yeah, I can see why, really. <laughs> They had a whole yeah, prison wide, some... whole federal prison wide war between blacks and and the AB went for one short period of time. That was yeah. When I first went in, it was the DC blacks. The DC blacks, yeah, that was who was involved. Yeah. I remember that now. Yeah, well, that's a uh, so. I'll now... tell you, the AB is they they got a lot of power. They're pretty powerful, even though there's only, I mean, there's none on the prison yards mm -hmm. uh, that are real. You know, AB that none of them on the yard. They're all locked down, but. But uh, one of them could go to a penitentiary and run the whole place because, you know, every white gang member that's there, you know, you, you got you know, like the dirty white boys and, you know, things like that. They they all, you know, strive to become uh, Aryan Brotherhood, you know, and mm -hmm. so the Aryan Brotherhood could tell them to do something and they're all going to do it, you know. So, yeah. It, it, do you think that is that because they have a lot of connections outside? They got a lot of people outside. That's a it's a real strong entity outside the penitentiary system so they can get a lot of stuff done or is it just people just want to be an ab i think they just want to be an ab the okay. the, the ab isn't what people portray it to be in, in as far as in, in prison i mean they're all about making money they're not about you know we hate blacks we hate spanish they're, they don't they don't you know i mean they do business with blacks and spanish okay. and it's not for them it's it's more about you know you guys sell the heroin we bring in the you know uh, we bring it in and you sell it or whatever, you know, and, and they, that's what they're about, you know, in prison. It's, so it's a, it's not really a racial thing. So let's go back to the Italians at, at Atlanta. Now, do you remember any, who were some of the other guys or is anybody that we'd know? Vicarina. Oh, he was there too. Uh, Patty Amato. Vicarina, Patty Amato, uh, Nikki Scarfo, Fafi Ionella, 
uh, Mike Tessetta, Bobby Gallagher. There's just a, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them that came through there, but those are, those guys were like there for years. Wow. So that was, uh, that was quite a little society that you guys had that you were hooked up with. What, I mean, did you all, were you like find hook up with different guys and play cards and, and in that group, yeah. did you all stick within your group and play cards or maybe play handball with each other or basketball or something? Yeah. Stick there's about, uh, yeah, there's about 25 of us, uh, total. And, uh, we would, you know, some of us like, like me, one thing that, that Chris, Christy ticked and still in me was that, you know, I needed to go to school. So I did a lot of schooling. Um, and I, I kept it up, you know, the whole time. Uh, but I got a degree in culinary arts and, uh, you know, just, just kept, kept busy when I wasn't doing that. I would be, you know, out walking the yard and me and Vic would usually walk the track, uh, for, you know, a couple hours every day, mm-hmm. but they would go like in the daytime, uh, they go play, you know, handball or and in the evening they played uh, pinochle uh, or cook. You know, uh, you know, there's a couple of them like Mike just said, he cooked a lot, you know, for us. You know, we get a lot of stuff out of the kitchen and just, you know, he'd make, you know, some good, good pasta dinners. Mm. So th- and that was back in this was it, uh, describe the way the cells where you guys were were you all kind of in the same cells i know like in atlanta or no in, in leavenworth they had the cuban section the cuban unit which is a hell for anybody that gets put in there and so the, what was your living arrangements like there in atlanta? right well the, the the cuban unit is it was just a five story tiers you okay. know five stories of, of just those uh it's like a giant bird cage in the middle of the floor you know but Mm-hmm. Um, Leavenworth, they remodeled everything. Uh, it's the same with with uh, Atlanta. They're no, you know, there's not cell bars anymore. Um, it's regular doors, and that they, you know, made the rooms a lot cleaner. So you, uh, you know, you've got, yeah. It's, I mean, it's pretty nice it's for prison. I don't want to say it's glorified. <laughs> it's not nice, but it's a lot better than what you know they portray on TV. You know, it's, but it's just a two man cell, the bunk beds, little small desk. Uh, uh, all in sink, of course, and mirror, and a little chair that comes, you know, a little plastic chair that you can put up under the desk. Mm-hmm. And that's about it for cell. Yeah, just just a typical cell. Yeah, everyone would sell up together, and we would get on the same tier. Okay. You know, so there'd be, you know, yeah, and then I was Vic Selly, so lived pretty good for being in prison. So then you got sent to Springfield. Now, my friend Steve got sent to Springfield as kind of a punishment. <laughs> he didn't really want to go down there because he, he knew there was less freedom to get around the penitentiary system, the pen, than he had up in I right. think it was Rochester where he was. So uh, you got sent to Springfield. Was that yeah, you well, have some health problems or were they yeah, punishing I, I you? Had a, uh, I had glaucoma uh, and they well, they couldn't figure out what, the, what, was, what was going on with my eye and, and I'm I was going blind, which I, I mean, eventually I, I did go blind in my left eye. It ended up being glaucoma. So I had to go down there and as a result of the glaucoma cataract started. And so they did a surgery on me there. And uh, uh, when I was there many years ago, it was before they had different uh, hospitals and you'd go out to the hospital for surgery, your local mm-hmm. city. Back then, everyone went to Springfield. They didn't care who it was yeah. or Rochester. You had to be a, you had to be someone special to get to Rochester, you know? <laughs> yeah. Steve did so, not like leaving there and going to Springfield. I know that. Yeah. 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 They say that Rochester was, was really sweet. So, yeah. but yeah, I was down there and um, just for a short period of time. And um, uh, I met with, uh, I don't know, there's a guy, Ernie boy. I had met him years before. And, and so he had sent word down to these guys that I was coming in. and okay. like Ernie boy, he was a, uh, I didn't know anything about him except that he was a heroin dealer mm-hmm. um, in New York. But and now he comes out, and now he's the alleged, the alleged boss of the Genovese. So, all right, Ernie Boy. You know, what, what, what's his full name? I, uh... Maurice D. Abramonti. Chris Ferrari told Vic Amuse told you know that that you know I was you know coming there to you know look out for me. Um, Vic had told me you know like six months later you know he goes you know when you got off that bus he goes you know. I'd have done anything in the world for you because Chris Fenari was, you know, he's like, you know, we're, you know, we're blood brothers, you know, and mm-hmm. and he goes, you're the only person in all the years that I've known Chris that he's ever recommended somebody to me because mm-hmm. he's never done that before, and mm-hmm. so you know, I did, you know, so that's a that was a pretty big deal, 
Yeah. So I, I said, well, that's cool. You know, so that was nice of Christy to do that. But yeah. So when you get down to Springfield and then, you know, he sent word ahead and, and you're okay. And you start meeting these other guys, Tony Ducks and Fat Tony. And uh, I have a question. Was, uh, was Lefty Rosario from New York there at that point in time? Do you remember? I don't, don't remember. Okay. What what about the, was there a guy there that had both of his legs cut off? He was in a wheelchair named Paul Hankish from West Virginia. I don't know. I, there was a guy there, yeah, that had his legs cut off. Okay. So he was my friend Steve had some relationship had a relationship with Lefty Ruggiero, who was the uh, Al Pacino character in that movie uh, Donnie Brasco, and and he he served his last few years in the pen down there, and his Paul Hankish was was there at the same time. And and he was yeah, did, connected did that, to the Pittsburgh mob. Did that Paul Hank he lose his legs in a bombing or something? A bombing when he was a young man, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I know who yeah, I, he was there when I was there. Funny story yeah, is, is Le Lefty told Paul Steve was standing there and Lefty told Paul as they were, you know, sitting around talking, he said, you know, he said, I don't know if I'd want to commit any crime with you. He said I don't know if you're a stand-up guy. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> he said, I told Lefty, he said, man, you've gone too far this time. <laughs> they yeah. all thought it was funny, of course. <laughs> so what what was that like with those guys? God, Tony Salerno and Tony Ducks, they were getting pretty yeah, they old were, by then. They were all, oh yeah, they were old. I mean, yeah, they were old. They, they you know, they'd come outside for, you know, maybe 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, and then want to get wheeled back in, and but uh, Tony Ducks was a character, or not Tony Ducks, uh, Fat Tony Slano. He was a character. He was funny. Uh, you know, he was he was a cantankerous old fella, but he was funny. Yeah. You know, at the same time, you know, it's just like you couldn't. You know, he's like a, you know, a big kid that was mad, but you couldn't get mad at him for it because it's just funny. You know, just. <laughs> but yeah, he was, he was a good guy. Always wanted to use the phone. You know, just. It would be bitching about not having the phone to use, <laughs> but yeah. Did, it, did you have cell phones and, down there? Were they smuggling in cell phones? Down I there? I didn't know. No, they didn't, didn't have see them, them down there. They must have had a little tighter uh -huh. setup. They, they didn't have those Atlanta guards down there in Springfield. Right. Well, I don't even think. I don't know if cell phones were out, or maybe they were were out back then. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't until like ninety seven, ninety eight okay. that we got cell phones. All right. So, so I didn't like Springfield though. I mean, I. You know, you go from, you know, like a, a nice place to, you know, a place where, you know, it's hard, you know, yeah, like you said, the guards, you can't get nothing there, you know, yeah. Springfield. So it was kind of, you know, it was different. Did you have two, two man cells down there? Yes. Yeah, who'd you sell? Well, uh, I, did you have a celly down there then? Um, yes, I did. I'm trying to remember what his name was. You couldn't move cells freely down there. I had a guy that had a, one of them bags on the side you know and uh, i didn't like yeah. that you know fat tony he was uh he was a really wealthy guy he was in he was involved he, he fell with that commission try uh case and and he had been part of the con what they called the concrete club and and he was uh who was he windows uh, gigante and the windows case yeah where they had like a 200 million dollar scam right, that was chris Ferrari and that was christy chick and pick Muso. Okay, and and that was uh, Fat Tony got some of that too, got a bunch yeah. of that, and and he was like, he was supposedly like the the Genovese boss, but really uh, the Chin was really the boss. Could could you see any evidence of? Uh, it's kind of hard. To, I'm not sure how to put this. That that they were, they were able to spread that money around and and buy favors. But I don't know about like counselors or anything like that okay. or you know social wardens or wardens or you know i yeah. mean I, I know that there was a captain um the and that there was a sis uh person that um would you know give up things and and whatnot for yeah. you know profit so they 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 had they had pretty good connections shall we say inside the in the penitentiary system not yeah. just with the other inmates because of their kind of criminal position in life but because of the money they had and the power they had on the outside right they were able yep. to get things done sure All yep right. and, yeah and, oh yeah then you were able to take advantage of that because you were with them that's what it's about being with somebody then you can take advantage of of their power 
and what they've got because you're right. with them. It was basically, a, you know, I had the, you know, the boss's ear. Yeah. Um, and so, and because of that, you know, people would come to me and ask me things to, you know, to, you know, to, cause you know, Vic didn't talk to the wall, let alone anybody else. You know, he's a pretty quiet guy. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, so, you know, and, and a lot of guys wouldn't even approach him so that they'd approach me. And, yeah. you know, this was, you know, after years of knowing him. And, and so Vic was well-respected. Um, I mean, most of the guys are, were, you know, well-respected. I mean, I never had a problem with any, I mean, I had one problem, one guy, and that was it. But otherwise, never with any guys. Um, they were always very respectful and, and gentlemen. So, so you left and and out of Springfield. Where'd you go back to then after that? Atlanta. And you went back to Atlanta. Went to Atlanta. Did you yeah. sp spend the rest of your time there? Um, no, I I uh, I didn't. I got in trouble and got a uh, another sentence while incarcerated. Mm. Uh, so I, I my bank robbery was 105 months. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting to the end of it. I actually only had, I think, four months left, and I was indicted by the, the U.S. government in the uh, Middle District of Florida uh, for importation of heroin, No, oh. and I received a, a life sentence. Oh, wow. At that time. Was that, in, was that some you had going before you went in that you were part of, or was that part of? Um, no, it was something that I started while incarcerated. While incarcerated. I was having... Uh, I was having, you know, drugs sent from uh, Rotterdam in uh, the Netherlands um, on a ship, and I brought over to Port Tampa, offloaded at Port Tampa, then taken to, you know, the East Coast. Wow. As a guy like you make those kinds of connections from inside the penitentiary, and I don't expect you to I know, tell it's me, crazy. Tell me, but... <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> I have to point it out. <laughs> You were you were connected really close to all these mob guys, <laughs> and, and a guy like you then can set up that kind of international thing. Uh, yeah, I know. Like I said, I don't expect you to tell me anything, but and yeah, I see so, you're not. Yeah, I up, <laughs> yeah no. I, I, so I, I went to trial and, and was convicted, uh, received you know a life sentence. Oh wow! And um, three years after that, four years after that, um, uh, I was. Uh, not indicted, but I was pulled out of the, the prison and taken back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa and put in front of a grand jury. Mm -hmm. to, they wanted to know about my connections with uh, alleged drug activities and money laundering in, in the area. I told them to go screw themselves and, you know, they threatened to put me in jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And uh, I said, okay, <laughs> took me back to prison. And then uh, I'd say a year, no, maybe 10 months later, they brought me back again. And put me in a, uh, they were trying to build a case on me and there was nothing to build, mm -hmm. but they had all these people and, you know, like five or six guys in the county jail in Cedar Rapids. And they didn't want to put me in the county jail with them because they feared for their safety. Um, so they put me in a, a jail that was, uh, I think it housed at the most 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, they had two sides, you know, one, it was just a hallway and one side of the hallway was, was, guys and the other side was girls and so they put me there again want me to go in front of a grand jury and i said no and uh they kept me in the cell there and i'm, I'm talking to a gal uh across the hall and i and i could and the food slots were open and i could actually see her you know yeah that you know, was quite a treat for, wasn't it after all those years yeah, i've been down 17 16 17 years and and you know what do you expect you know of course yeah, really. be, you know <laughs> hey there how you doing you know and start <laughs> yeah. talking but um, and so we talked for a couple of weeks, getting, uh, yeah, getting uh, notes back and forth. Then one morning, like four in the morning, four thirty in the morning, guards rush me in the cell and drag me into a conference room. And there's, I don't know, eight different people there: the U.S. attorney, the uh, head of the FBI. I mean, all the Tom Miller, the, the Iowa Attorney General. I mean, just you know, all these big shots in there. And they're, this guy gets in my face, starts saying, "We know you got letters from her. We need them now." You know, and was pointing his finger at me, and I, I went. So I, you know, I mean, I've been in jail for a long time. You're not supposed to do this. So I just went, went off, and you know, 
Yeah. Uh, they, you know, knocked me down, tied me up, threw me in the cell. <laughs> So I called the lawyer that afternoon. I told him what happened. He goes, you don't know who that is? I said, no, I don't, I don't even know her name. And uh, then he tells me. And then she has been involved in, in the murder of five people. Uh, and uh, two of them were, were kids, six and a nine-year-old. And uh, I was like, man, that's crazy. So that's what's the reason. They were thinking that she was giving me information on, uh -huh. you know, on that. So she did give me information eventually, you know, after a couple more days. Because I started asking her questions. And uh, I, she had ended up giving me maps to the bodies of where mm -hmm. the kids were buried. And so I turned them over to the government and got a reduction of sentence for that. So that's, um, and, that's, and that's why, why I got That's why you're sitting here today. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's well, the that reason. Was, that was an opportune. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's the, I've never testified on anybody at any trial ever, yeah. you know? Um, and so it was like different for me. It's weird, but I did, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, I, it is what it is. You know I mean? I cooperated and, and so I'm a cooperating witness and, you know, some people can deal with it. Some can't, you yeah. know, and, it, it, you know, I respect, you know, everyone's opinion and, you know, yeah, well, you're, that was that. You're not the 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 usual rat or snitch by any stretch of the imagination. So I right, don't know. yeah. But some people have a certain code that that I've noticed. At least sure. people that comment on Facebook, they have a certain code that that of course they've never been yeah. in position. So you know, you're sitting there looking at the rest of your life in the penitentiary. I don't know what yeah. they were threatening you with, <laughs> but <laughs> worked out for everybody, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, I did. One last person or situation you'd like to tell us about before we wind this up? Anybody famous else that, that you had some uh, connections, had a story, got a story about? Well, like those prison stories about the famous people. <laughs> oh, how oh, Sammy the Bull. No, really, yeah. Tell us about Sammy the Bull. Sammy the Bull, and, and you know, I I, I I try not to talk disparagingly about anyone, but Sammy the Bull is a piece of shit. I mean, <laughs> he's a legitimate piece of shit. Yeah. Um. I mean, he's he takes advantage of anything that he can out of anyone, and he like now on his, and, and I didn't know anything about podcasts or anything like that. You know, I mean, I I, I work seven days a week. I I don't watch TV or watch mm -hmm. the computers and so, but they were telling me about uh artwork that Sammy the Bull was doing and uh, so I go down to the computer and go to and he's selling you know all these different you know charcoals and, and acrylics that he said he that he allegedly claims that he did mm -hmm. and I'm thinking <laughs> well he didn't do them he didn't do not one of them <laughs> uh, Sammy can't draw a straight line <laughs> but then I find out that he's selling them for $200 a piece and has sold tons of them yeah so then, you know, he's not trying to help the the actual artists, you know. You know, one guy's a, a real close friend of mine, uh, the guy that did all of his tattoo work. Everyone can get on these podcasts and, you know, and but why not why lie? Why not just tell the truth, you know? I mean, yeah. Like the paintings and, and artwork, you know. I don't care if he sells. I mean, my buddy doesn't care, but break him off, you know. I mean, hey, I know, you know, yeah, he, break him he off. He could have got piece. 20 more drawn up, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah, every, you know, he didn't he doesn't like to share. And <laughs> and so, you know, that you know, that's just that shows you the character of that guy. You know, I mean, yeah, you got guys that are doing, you know, triple life sentences that could use a hundred dollars a month, and here he's made, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and he's and he, you know, he doesn't want to help nobody out. <laughs> and uh just a lot, you know, all of his tattoos. Uh, my buddy, he was a, my friend was the leader of the AB and he's the one that did uh, Sammy's tattoos. Mm -hmm. And they're all like, like just different things. And a lot of them are AB related, you know, uh, different women with, you know, things like that. And, but he goes on his little podcast and tells everybody that, you know, there's a meaning behind this one, you know, I did this and then I, you know, and, and I'm like, come on, man. He's, <laughs> you know, he's just, you know, I just don't like that shit. Yeah. You know, that, that ain't cool. But and well, you yeah, got your just, own uh, business yeah. now, and you're working seven days a week, and and making your way. Yep. It sounds like. Yeah, well, I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying. I I, uh, I remove uh, dead ash trees. 
Okay, uh, interesting. Yeah, there's a lot uh, of like in Iowa, ash, there's 50 million of them. Yeah, that is ash borers. Uh, yep. uh, uh, yeah, destroyed our ash trees here in the Midwest. I got a job two yeah. days after I got out, you know, and just kept working since, you know. Yeah, if you got a good work ethic and, and you're willing to put in the time, guy can make it, you know. You may not, yeah. you're not okay. going to be driving a limo and you're not going to be flying on a private jet, but you can make it. That's what I did all my life. Right. Guy can make it. Yeah. <laughs> Just got to have yeah. a, a half, some common sense and a little bit of intelligence and a good work ethic. And, and that's all you really need in this, in this country, if yeah. you ask me. Yeah. I wish I'd have learned that many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you tried some shortcuts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You were you were trying yeah, to grab sure. that brass ring that, or that gold ring with that heroin thing. And that's, yeah. uh, I understand the lure of easy money has a mighty strong appeal, but <laughs> there's a price yeah. to pay. All right, that's Robert yeah. McNeese. I really appreciate you coming on the show, Robert. I, uh, uh, I wish you luck. Oh, my pleasure. So thanks a lot, guys. Uh, you know, I like to ride motorcycles and you better look out for motorcycles when you're out there. And if you have a problem with PTSD, as I always say, go to the VA website and get that hotline. And our friend, former mobster, Anthony Ruggiano at reformedgangsters.com. And he also has a, his own YouTube show. He has a hotline. If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, he's happy to help you. You can get a hold of him. He's, he works in a treatment center or has some kind of a treatment facility down in Florida, I believe. So you want to, a lot of times we want to leave our old playgrounds and playmates, go down to Florida and, and go into treatment. If you think you got a problem with drugs or alcohol with Anthony. So thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>